You will hear a number of different recordings, and you have to answer questions on what you hear. There'll be time for you to read the instructions and questions, and you have a chance to check your work. All the recordings will be played only once. The test is in four sections. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to your answer sheet. Now turn to section one. Section one. You will hear a telephone conversation between a customer and a sales assistant for a mail order company. First, you have some time to look at questions one to six. You will see that there is an example that has been done for you. On this occasion only, the conversation relating to this will be played first. Good morning. How can I help? I'd like some help with ordering a book. I've tried your website, but it says it's offline at the moment, and to call this number. The answer is website. So website has been written in the space. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions one to six. Good morning. How can I help? I'd like some help with ordering a book. I've tried your website, but it says it's offline at the moment. And to call this number. Oh yes, I do apologise. We've been having some problems with it, but I can take the order over the phone if you like. That would be great. It's a gift, you see. Can I take your name, please? Yes, of course. It's Zara Freeman. Is that Zara with an S or a Z? With a Z. Z. A R A. Just writing that down. Right. What was the title of the book you'd like me to order? I think it's called Future Words. No, hang on. Sorry, that's Future Worlds. Okay. Just typing that in. Ah,、uh, I can't seem to find it. Do you know the name of the author? I'll do a search. Yes, it's by a man called Richard Watson. Watson, as in W A T S O N. Yes, that's right.、Mm. Oh yes, here it is. It's only just been released. It's a self-help book. Is that right? Yes. Now it costs twelve pounds ninety-nine. Yep, that's fine. Okay, how would you like to pay? Is a debit card okay?、Mm, no, sorry, we only accept credit cards. Oh dear. Um, just let me check to see if I have it with me. Oh yes, here it is. Can you read me the long? Before you hear the rest of the conversation. You have some time to look at questions seven to ten. Now listen and answer questions seven to ten. Right, almost done. Now I just need the delivery details. Right, I've got my friend's address here. It's sixty-two, Green Gardens, London, N twenty-two. Just typing that in. Fifty-two, Green Gardens. No, it's number sixty-two. 
Now, what kind of delivery would you like? What are the options? There are two. The free delivery option takes five days, or you can pay an extra two pounds twenty-five to have it sent out first class tomorrow. That would come to a total of fifteen pounds twenty-four p. Hmm. Well, my friend's birthday is next week, so it should get there in time with the free delivery. So、uh, I think I'll take that. Right. That means that it will be delivered on the twenty-first of February, any time from eight a.m. to six p.m. Is that okay? Well, I know my friend leaves early for work, so would it be possible for him to pick it up from the local post office instead? I'm afraid that won't be possible, but I could add some special instructions for it to be left with someone else, a neighbour perhaps. Actually, yes, I have met the old lady who lives next door, and she's bound to be home. Could you leave it with her? Fine. I'll add that if he's not home, then the package should be left with the neighbour. That's great. Thanks very much for your help. My pleasure. Thank you for shopping. With... That is the end of section one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section two. You will hear an online guide giving a tour of the home of the future. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to sixteen. Now listen and answer questions eleven to sixteen. Welcome to the Homes of the Future online website. I will be your virtual guide around the homes you could soon be living in. Let's begin our tour in the bedroom. Firstly, the bed is programmed to gently rock you awake in the mornings. There'll be no more rude awakenings by an alarm clock, and it will also know what time you need to wake up, as it will get that information directly from your personal digital assistant, that is, your PDA, which will be inserted into you. Let's move to the wardrobe. Those are your musical shoes. That generate music while you walk. The music will change according to how fast you're walking: calm music for a relaxing stroll, and faster beats for when you're in a hurry. You'll feel like you're walking on air. What's more, your clothes are also intelligent. They sense how you're feeling, and then. Change colour. The fabric that they're made of also converts your body heat into a low voltage electricity generator for some of the gadgets that are now inside you, like your PDA, for example. Moving on to the bathroom. So, after waking up, you need a shower. There's no need to turn on any taps, as the house will know exactly what temperature you like the water in the mornings. Though you'll still have to wash yourself. From the bathroom, we move into the kitchen. Now, 
We've all had that horrible feeling when you can't find your keys just as you're about to go out. Well, in the home of the future, you wouldn't need to panic. All you need to do is an internet search. All items are now programmed with a tracking device so that they will light up and signal to you where they are. Just in case the object is upstairs, the house will project its position on your fridge. Speaking of your fridge, this is now as intelligent as your clothes. Not only does it keep a record of when you're running low on everyday essentials, like milk, but it emails your local grocery store, which will deliver them for you. It can also help with planning meals if you have friends over for dinner by moving the chicken from the freezer so that it'll thaw in time. Before you hear the rest of the tour, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Lastly, here we are in the living area, which you'll be pleased to hear is still the heart of the family home. Let's enter the room. Now, to the left of the entrance is the main seating area with a sofa and directly opposite the entrance is an armchair. The sofa backs onto the wall and the armchair faces to the left across the coffee table to a blank wall. So, where is the TV, I hear you ask? Well, this entire wall is the television. The whole thing is a plasma screen designed to show your TV, surf the internet or, when it's not in use, it displays anything you want it to, from family pictures to famous works of art. On the opposite wall to the sofa is a fireplace, which still has a real fire. Nothing beats that now, does it? But the rug in front of the fire now also monitors the temperature and either opens or closes the chimney so as not to overheat the room. It still has its normal uses though. As you can see, the cat likes it very much and is curled up on it, happy as can be. What else is on offer? Well, for entertainment, the family still reads books so there is a bookcase on the wall to the right of the entrance. But what about the computer? Well, it's inside your head and powered by those intelligent clothes you're wearing. Imagine this. As you're sitting relaxing on the armchair, you'll be able to reach out and put your hot drink on the coffee table in front of the armchair you suddenly remember that you need to send work an email. That same coffee table, holding your cup, is also a touch-sensitive keyboard for you to type your email and then click send. All you need to do to activate it is say email and the image of a keyboard will appear. Well, I hope you've enjoyed your tour around the home of the future and that you'll come visit again soon. Bye-bye. That is the end of section two. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Section 3. You will hear a tutor talking to a student about a future assignment. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hi, Professor James. Have you got a minute? You see, I'm having a bit of trouble getting started on my graduate employability assignment. Well, OK, as long as it doesn't take longer than 10 minutes, as I have a meeting to get to at 3.30. Yep, fine. It shouldn't take long at all. OK, Sally. Tell me what you've done so far, and we'll go from there. Well, as you suggested, I chose three local businesses and contacted them via telephone to introduce myself. That's good. Well, the thing is, I couldn't get past the secretary of two of them. Do you have any suggestions? What about following up with a letter stating what time you'll be calling again? Oh, that's a good idea. I hadn't thought of that. <laughs> so, tell me about the one you have contacted. Right. Well, he was very helpful, actually. He received the survey I emailed him and has already sent it back. I've had a very quick look at it, but haven't had a chance to write it up yet. So far, so good. Carry on. Well, apart from that, I've also found a lot of statistics that exist on the starting salaries graduates begin on once they finish studying. There's some really interesting stuff out there. Did you know, for example, that your average engineer earns nearly as much as a medical graduate? <laughs> yes, I did. Gosh, I had no idea. <laughs> Having second thoughts about a career in human resources, are we? <laughs> no, but I was surprised. Anyway, getting back to where I was, I've gone to the library, but the books you recommend have already been taken out, apart from one, that is. It's called A Starting Success. I haven't read it yet, but I've taken it out, and it's on my list of things to do. Have you come up with a plan yet? Yes, and I've written my hypothesis as well as my introduction, but that's where I've got stuck. I don't really know how I'm going to be able to present all of the information, as there's so much of it. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Well, firstly, I'd recommend you start with analyzing what the employer said. Now, can I have a look at the questionnaire you wrote? Yes, here it is. Thanks. Oh, dear. Well, it's no wonder you're overwhelmed with information. You've collected a lot of information which can be overwhelming. Oh, dear. That took me ages. And does that mean I can't use it? Afraid so. But don't worry, if you've got a pen and paper, I'll quickly give you some pointers, and then you can rejig it to get the information you're looking for. OK, um, just a minute. I know there's a pen in here somewhere. OK, got it. Right. Well, first and foremost, you need to be clear. There's no point having a beautifully worded document throughout that no one understands. Use language that is simple. Right, got that. What next? You need to catch the reader's attention at the start of the document. And you need to find the right balance between formal and informal language. Your survey isn't an official document, but more of a living one that serves a purpose 
So neutral language is best. Okay. Just writing that down. Okay. The next one's what your mistake was this time. Try not to use open-ended questions, or you'll find it impossible to collate your results. Yep. I think I've learned my lesson there. <laughs> what else? Scales really do make the job of completing the questionnaire easier for the recipients by saving them lots of time and effort writing. I take your point. Anything else? Uh-huh. One last thing. Make sure you've thought about the logic of your questions. There's nothing worse than trying to make choices about things that seem to have no order. Right. Got it. I see where I went wrong now, and we'll try to do better next time. Don't worry. It's a very easy mistake to make, and one that many people come across the first time they do this kind of assignment. Okay, Sally, I really must rush. I'm late for my appointment. Of course. Thanks for your help. I'll see you in class tomorrow. Bye. That is the end of Section 3. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Section 4. You will hear a student giving a presentation about the process of urbanization. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40. Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Hi, good morning everyone. I'm here today to present my findings on the process of urbanisation and its impact on the environment. As you know, urbanisation involves the movement of people from the countryside to the cities. As this process continues, the cities of the world continue to grow. I will demonstrate how this growth is eating away at the planet's most fertile land. My research has focused on two studies that looked at land use in the United States. These have shown that since its independence, only 3% of all land in the United States has been built on. However, the same studies have also shown that the resulting loss of productive land is comparatively much, much greater. This isn't so much of a problem in America as it has a relatively low ratio of people to land. However, most other countries are not so blessed, the impact of which could have dire consequences for the future. The real danger here is if this pattern were to be repeated by developing countries, it could have a major effect on the world's food supplies in the next 50 years. In order to reach this conclusion, several research methods were adopted. A group of scientists in the United States used a weather satellite that normally maps moonlit cloud cover at night. However, on nights when there were no clouds, they used the satellite to map the generation of heat from city lights. They then took the data and divided land use into three categories, urban, semi-urban and non-urban land use. Next, they calculated how active the vegetation is 
in each region by using different satellites. When they combined this information with previous statistics and weather conditions, they came up with a number for total productivity for all areas. So what did the results of this process of land classification show? Well, firstly, they proved that although only a tiny percentage of the land in the United States is urbanised, and 29% of land is used for agricultural purposes, the land which has been built on actually has the best soils. These were independently corroborated by a second team of scientists in San Francisco, whose results show that this process is happening even faster in the southeastern corner of the United States. This means that land that is extremely productive from an agricultural point of view is being taken over by lawns, golf courses and a few scattered trees. As a direct result of urbanisation, the researchers in San Francisco calculated that every year 91 million tonnes of plants are lost in the US. So what does this mean for the future? Well, I have come up with some of my own ideas for practical solutions. Countries should calculate whether urbanisation is happening on their fertile lands too, especially if they have large populations compared to the amount of land available, like India and China, for example. If it is, then every effort should be made to stop the process from happening. This can be done in many ways. One of them is to stop investing in the infrastructure of those areas. If people don't have the facilities they need, they won't want to live there. But in my opinion, the main solution here is to offer people financial incentives to move away from fertile land to areas that are less valuable in agricultural terms. I hope you've enjoyed my presentation this morning. Thanks for your kind attention. I will now take any questions if you have. That is the end of section four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.